Good evening. I'm Jonathan Anton, uh, a professor at the law school, and it is my great privilege to welcome you to this year's Frank J. Battisti Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm standing in for our dean, Lawrence Mitchell, who very much regrets that he cannot be here. Uh, he is out of town on a long planned trip to do what deans are supposed to do, which is to say he's out uh, raising money uh, to uh, maintain uh, the programs that we have and to uh, try to enhance the opportunities that we can provide to our students. The Battisti Lecture honors the memory of Judge Frank Battisti, who served for more than 30 years on the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio, uh, a number of those years as Chief Judge of the Court. Judge Battisti was not one of our graduates, but he was a great friend of the law school. Quite a few of his clerks were our graduates, and I got to know Judge Battisti because several of my students were among his clerks. Indeed, this lecture series came about because of the devotion of Judge Battisti's clerks who helped to endow the series. Let me ask uh, those clerks who are here if they could uh, rise just so that they can be recognized. And there is at least one member of Judge Battisti's family here, and that is retired Judge Diane Karpinski, uh, who's down here in front. Uh, and I apologize if I've uh, missed anybody else in the family. As I said, this series honors the memory of Judge Battisti, and we have had some extraordinary lecturers in this series, some from the law, some from other areas that also reflected Judge Battisti's eclectic interests. Previous lecturers have included such prominent judges as Leon Higginbotham, Nathaniel Jones, and Jack Weinstein. Distinguished legal scholars such as Lee Bollinger, Michael Klarman, and Frank Wu, who, by the way, is himself a former Battisti clerk. Uh, political philosopher Jean Bethke Elstein, historian of education Diane Ravitch, and advocates such as Sister Helen Prejean and Julian Bond. Our speaker tonight is one of the country's leading civil rights lawyers and one of the law school's most distinguished graduates, Fred Gray. Uh, Fred spoke to my First Amendment class this afternoon, and I'm not going to take up additional time trying to introduce him. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over in just a moment to Chief Judge Solomon Oliver of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio uh, to do that introduction. Before I do so, let me just mention a couple of things. Uh, at the conclusion of Mr. Gray's lecture, we will have an opportunity for questions. Because this program is being recorded and to be uh, put out on, on, the, uh, on the web, um, we would ask that you use one of the handheld microphones in the aisles uh, for your questions. Um, at the conclusion of the entire program, we invite you to join us for a reception outside the auditorium back around in the foyer on the Euclid Avenue side of the building. Now, to introduce our lecturer, Chief Judge Oliver. Good evening. I'm doubly honored to have the opportunity to be here and to introduce our speaker tonight, Attorney Fred Gray. The first reason I'm honored is because Frank Battisti, as many of you know, served on and was chief judge on the court on which I now sit. And I now also serve as chief judge. Now, as an attorney, I appeared in front of him on a number of occasions, and we also served as colleagues on the court for a brief period. When uh, Judge Battisti died, there was a issue of the Cleveland State Law Review where many of us wrote about him. And I'll just read very briefly uh, a little bit of that. I first came to know him when I arrived in Cleveland in 1976 
to serve as an assistant United States attorney. That was the year of the Reed versus Rose decision, the Cleveland school desegregation case for which he will be forever known. I grew up in the South and attended segregated public schools there. Consequently, I had a natural and keen interest in any decision which sought to eradicate discrimination and the pernicious effects of any, in any sphere, as well as any judge who had the courage and commitment to make such a difficult decision. And then I concluded, uh, really, the piece I wrote by saying, he knew of the special role of the courts in ensuring individual rights and as a guardian of our Constitution, the fundamental document which must be protected from the ill winds of the moment. And so I'm proud because Judge Battisti was a dear colleague. He was an independent-minded jurist, and he was an excellent colleague. I'm especially, especially happy to have the opportunity to introduce Attorney Fred Gray. He grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, and I grew up in Bessemer, Alabama. And even though I've known of him for many years, and he's been a hero of mine, this is actually the first opportunity that I've had to meet him. I know his brother Fred, I'm sorry, I know his brother Tom, who lived here in Cleveland and worked uh, here for many years, but I, ne I never, I never met uh, Attorney Fred Gray. Now, he grew up in Montgomery, he got his bachelor's degree from Alabama State, but he had no law school in Alabama that he could attend because there was no black law school. These were the days of separate but equal. And so the state uh, had to pay, as I understand, to send him off to a law school of his choice. And he chose Case Western Reserve University. So many of you know him around here and of his stellar record. I understand that when he was in law school and perhaps even before, he dedicated himself without saying it to coming back to Montgomery. And I heard that he said, I will destroy everything segregated that I can find. And there was a lot that he could find. <laughs> I can tell you firsthand. Buses, parks, schools, insane asylums, libraries, restaurants, you name it, it was segregated. And so that's the South he returned to uh, in an effort to destroy everything segregated he could find. A at age 24, he met Rosa Parks and he became her lawyer when she refused to move from her seat uh, on a bus to give it up to a white man. And he also on occasion served to represent Dr. Martin Luther King in various endeavors. Let me just say very quickly a little bit about some of the cases that are really legendary, cases that he brought that really uh, contributed very much to the development of constitutional law. The case involving Rosa Parks and the Montgomery Improvement Association went to the U.S. Supreme Court, Browder versus Gale, in 1956. And ultimately, the Supreme Court upheld the lower court decisions prohibiting segregation on city buses. Fred Gray said, I'm going to destroy everything segregated I can find. And he started uh, that process. The next uh, case I want to mention very briefly, and I'm not going to take too long, was a case NAACP versus Alabama. The state of Alabama outlawed the NAACP. And so Fred Gray and another band of lawyers worked for many years going up and down to the Supreme Court. But ultimately, they were successful and the NAACP was able to operate again. Another case uh, that he um, was the lawyer on was Williams versus Wallace. And this case has to do with the march from Selma to Montgomery. He filed a class action uh, lawsuit on behalf of African Americans who sought permission to march from Selma to Montgomery. And he got an injunction uh, which required, um, which required uh, the, the state to give protection to the marches. 
Now, most of you, if you are students of constitutional law, have heard of Gamillion versus Lightfoot. And that's the case where the state or the city, in any event, the government, the legislature, we drew the boundaries of Tuskegee so that blacks were uh, not in it, even though they were a very concentrated group in Tuskegee. And so clearly a case of, the, of depriving African Americans of the franchise was deliberately meant to do so. And he took that case to the Supreme Court and argued that case and was successful. And it was really the forerunner of many constitutional cases dealing with one person, one vote. Uh, again, uh, Fred Gray was attacking racism and discrimination and segregation wherever he could find it. He spent a lot of his time, his years, attacking segregation in schools. And he had one case, Lee versus Macon County Board of Education, that was a seminal case in this area. In 1967, the court issued an order integrating all of Alabama's educational institutions that were not already on the court order. Again, Fred Gray attacking everything segregated that he could find. He's also known for bringing a lawsuit uh, for the victims of the so-called Tuskegee syphilis study. Way back in 1932, the United States Public Health Service began a study of the effects of untreated syphilis on more than 600 African-American males in Macon County. They were never told they were part of the study. They were simply believing they were receiving proper medical treatment. And they were not given penicillin, which could cure the disease. And after the study became uh, public in 1972, Fred Gray filed a lawsuit against Alabama and the U.S. Public Health Service that was settled in 1975 for $10 million in medical treatment. And just as important, President Bill Clinton in 1967 I'm sorry, 1997, apologized on behalf of the United States for what happened to those men who were involved in that syphilis study. Attorney Fred Gray was in the legislature for a while. In 1970, he was one of two African Americans elected to the state legislature since Reconstruction. He was one of the first two to be reelected since Reconstruction. He's received numerous awards and honors. They're, in fact, too numerous to mention. But I would mention that in 1985, he served as the president of the National Bar Association. In 1996, he received the Spirit of Excellence Award from the American Bar Association. In 2002, he became the first African-American president of the Alabama Bar Association. When I talk about lawyers like Fred Gray, and there are not many of them, I refer to them as the second founders. We all know who the first founders were, and they are revered in our culture, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be. But we all know that even though they had some of the principles right, they had the application wrong. And so it took generations, generations of lawyers and dedicated uh, lawyers to give the Constitution its proper meaning and scope. And some of those names you may have heard, and I will quickly conclude. But one was Charles Hamilton Houston, and another was William H. Hastie, who later became a federal judge and for whom I clerked on the Third Circuit. But they carved out, at the NAACP, a strategy which led to Brown versus Board of Education. And they had to start out slow, we would call it today. And so they first attacked separate but equal facilities. Salaries were not the same, that's not, that's not equal. And they did that with schoolhouses houses and that kind of thing. And then they went to graduate education because there, there was not likely to be any graduate education for African Americans at all. And so you couldn't have an argument that it was separate or equal. And so what happened was the next thing they did was to make sure that people like Attorney Fred Gray could at least get his education paid for by going out of state because the state had an obligation to make sure that African American students had those kinds of opportunities. Fred Gray, Attorney Fred Gray, became part of that band of lawyers and he worked feverishly to make sure the Constitution had meaning for all of its citizens. 
And I am sure that were it not for him and lawyers like him, there is no way that I would have the opportunity that I enjoy today. There is no way that I would be chief judge of any court, or there is no way that I would have many of the opportunities, other opportunities I've had. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming an American hero, my hero, a great, great man, Attorney Fred Gray. What do you say when you get an introduction like that? <laughs> they tell me it is somewhat like liniment. It's good to rub on, but not to take in. <laughs> Thank you very much, George Oliver. I appreciate those kind remarks. I'm accustomed to being introduced to audiences, but not by judges and certainly not by chief federal judges. But I am appreciative and I appreciate the kind uh, remarks that he said. I only hope that I can continue to try to make a contribution to help to continue to change the problems as we see them and as I have seen them over the years. To the faculty of this law school and to my good friend Jonathan, who has really worked hard in getting me to be here tonight. <laughs> you know, many lawyers, and they, they tell me, I've never been a, a part of a large law firm, but I understand these most prestigious law firms now have it so that when you get a certain age, it's a mandatory retirement. If I were a member of such a firm, I probably would have been retired. But since I started my own, <laughs> and nobody in it ha has enough nerve yet to tell me to retire, <laughs> I'm still there. And I went by that office uh, yesterday morning before I drove to Montgomery to drive here. So I just want to thank so much Jonathan Inston for what he has done. He was not at this law school when I was here, but uh, I met him sometime later. Let's just give him a hand for the work he and other members of his staff has done. I'm happy to be back on this campus. On September the 21st, 1951, 60 years ago, at the age of 20, I caught a segregated train and rode a segregated car from Montgomery to Cincinnati and then from Cincinnati to Cleveland to enroll in what was then Western Reserve University. I had never been in an integrated society before. All of my life through my high school was in a, a black situation in black communities with black schools did attend a church school where we had some white teachers, but even that was a complete segregated situation. So I'm happy to be back on this campus. And uh, when I was enrolled here 60 years ago, I lived on the campus, lived at 11408 Bellflower Road, which was then Hudson House. Yesterday afternoon, I walked from the Glidden House up to look at Hudson House to see whether it was still there. Found a new building next to it, but that building's still there even though it is not in use. 
But I would walk from there past this structure on the front and on the side, go to the law school, which was then on the upper end of Adele, but on the other side of the med school. And I lived at, that, uh, on Bellflower for some two years. Then I moved to a new dormitory, which was right across the street right next to Servants Hall, used to be Foster Hall. And I lived on the top floor of Foster Hall. There was a little balcony right outside of Mando that overlooked Servants Hall, and that's where I spent my last year. So I am very familiar with this building, at least I'm familiar with the outside of it, but I've never been in it until tonight. So I'm indeed delighted to be back. I noticed according to the communication that went out about our talk, and I'm appreciative to the judge whose name this lecture bears, that I'm supposed to talk about the road to justice. The publication continued to say, I will discuss the enormous progress our nation has made toward racial justice since World War II. The announcement concludes by saying, as counsel for Rosa Parks, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the victims in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study experiment, I am supposed to draw from those cases and talk with you a little bit this afternoon. Now, Judge Oliver has already told you about those cases, uh, most of them. <laughs> so you don't want me to, to talk about that again. I can talk with you about, when you talk about the road to justice, I'm not at all sure that we have obtained, well, I know we haven't obtained justice. It is still a long road and very evasive to obtain, but we have to keep trying. I can talk to you about the road that we have taken since I left this university 55 years ago toward seeking social justice for American citizens. When I enrolled as a law student at this university, it never entered my mind that I would ever be invited back to receive <laughs> many of the awards which this university has given me, including the doctor, doctoral degree. I never thought of ever being invited to participate in any kind of annual lecture. However, there was one thing that was on my mind then, and that same motivating fact that was on my mind while I was here was the motivating fact in which I decided while a junior at Alabama State College for Negroes in Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy around 1950, that I wanted to become a lawyer. Now, you know, people ask me quite often, they say, how is it you happen to have represented Rosa Parks? And how is it you happen to have represented Dr. King? What people don't realize is that those persons were just like the 40,000 other African Americans who were in Montgomery, Alabama at that time. We all were there. We all were suffering and had the same problems that needed to be obtained. I was not a person 
So what I usually have to do is let people know how I got involved in the Civil Rights Movement, because people got involved in the movement for various reasons. I just attended uh, on Thursday of last week uh, an unveiling of a plaque right outside of the city hall in Montgomery uh, for Mrs. Parks. It's taken all this time for us to finally get a plaque there, but I went and I participated in it. But I'm not a person who always wanted to be a lawyer. As a matter of fact, as I was growing up on the west side of Montgomery, the ghetto section where nothing good supposed to have come out of, I didn't even know any lawyers. There were probably only two professions in the South that African-American males would be considered good, respectable professions. And I think all of you know what they are. One is a what? A what? Preacher. A preacher, that's right. And the other one is a what? Undertaker. A teacher. And actually, there was a third one to the undertaker, but I never thought about the undertaker. <laughs> I wanted to be thinking about the living and not the dead. <laughs> so I decided I was going to be both. My mother sent me off to our church school and I went up and traveling around with the president of the school, soliciting, recruiting students, and raising money. And when I finished in the fall of 47, I'd gotten, I finished a little early, and I decided to go back home so I would learn to become a teacher. I lived on the west side of town. Alabama State was on the east side of town. I worked for the local newspaper, served as circulation manager for the afternoon paper. So I would have to go downtown to check in and out back to my district on the east side of town. So I use a public transportation system in Montgomery from as little as twice a day to as much as six or eight times a day. I saw people of color had all kinds of problems on buses. I never personally had a problem because I have been a person who have tried to, uh, uh, tried to avoid personally being involved in problems. Because once you become involved in a problem yourself, then you can't help somebody else solve a problem because you have a problem of your own. But as I travel around and as I saw our people who were mistreated and one man was even killed as a result of an altercation on the bus in Montgomery, I also recognized that everything in Montgomery at that time was completely segregated based on race. And I just thought it was wrong. Now for an upper teenager in Montgomery to think that way is a little thinking out of the box. But I made a secret commitment. And the best thing about that commitment was I kept it secret. <laughs> because if I had told somebody, it may never have developed. But it was very simple. I was going to finish Alabama State. I was going to enroll in somebody's law school someplace in the country, not even apply to the University of Alabama because I know they weren't going to admit me. Finish law school, return to Alabama, take the bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. Now for a teenage black boy in Montgomery to think that way in the early 50s was almost unheard of. And you can say, well, lawyer, it's easy for you to say that's what your desire was then. Well, let me tell you what happened. In May of 51, I finished Alabama State with honors. September, I enrolled in law school here. 
finished in three years. In June, I graduated. And I decided out of an overabundance of caution, I better stop by Columbus and take the Ohio bar just in case. <laughs> Took it in June, went on to Alabama. The last week in July, I took the Alabama bar. And you know, it's tough when you've taken one bar and don't know the result, and when you've taken two and don't know the results, it is double trouble. But somehow I survived, and in August of 1954, I was advised by both the Ohio Supreme Court and the Alabama Supreme Court that I had passed the first time and was licensed to practice law in the two states then. And on September the 8th, 1954, I became a member of the Alabama Bar Association. I am now ready to start the journey of destroying everything segregated I could find. But I still haven't told anybody. And did not tell anybody about that desire until some 40 years later. Because there's a way that people can do things if they know things. But finally, when I got ready to write my autobiography, I decided at least I better let them know a part of what happened. But do you know what? Six months after I started, I was licensed to practice. I had my first civil rights case. It wasn't Mrs. Parks. It wasn't Dr. King, even though I was his first civil rights lawyer. He had many after me, but none before. It was a 15-year-old girl named Claudette Carbon who lived in the northeast part of Montgomery, a very small section where black people lived that were surrounded by whites. So they had to take, the kids who lived in that area that's called King Hill had to take the public school system or, or the public buses go downtown, then transfer to go to the black high school at Booker T. Washington. And that's what Claudette did, along with all the kids who lived. There's only about four or five streets in that area. She and those children did that every day, and they've been doing it for years. That was a, a, a custom in Montgomery at the time, the first 10 seats. There was two on the front and two on the cross that black people just didn't sit there. But any of the others, it was a kind of imaginary line that it kind of, that wasn't really a sign that anybody really enforced, but the bus driver had the authority to do whatever he wanted to do on buses. Claudette decided, well, she was on her way home that one day on the 2nd of March, 1955 sat in a seat on the bus, similar to where she had sat before, and nothing happened. But this day you had more white people came on the bus than blacks. And certainly more than usual. And what happened was the driver asked Claudette to get up and give her seat to a white person. And she wouldn't. She said she had paid her money, she had sat in that seat before, she wasn't sitting in the white section, and she just sat. Asked her to move, she didn't. The police came, they asked her to move, she basically didn't move. They literally drug Claudette off the bus. Of course, Claudette had no idea what was gonna happen to her <laughs> when she left home that morning. But she did what any teenager does when 
to get in trouble, you called home and talked to mama and she got hold to Mr. E.D. Nixon, who was Mr. Civil Rights, who got hold to the young lawyer and they got me to represent Claudette and I represented Claudette. But the same persons who later came to the rescue of Rosa Parks, Joanne Robinson, who taught at Alabama State and who at that time was uh, head of the Women's Political Council, an organization of black professional women who really were trying to help conditions in Montgomery. She had had a, a problem on a city bus in 1948. So she was ready. Mr. Nixon, Mr. Civil Right was ready. And of course, the young lawyer was ready. I represented her before Judge Hill in the juvenile court of Montgomery County. I raised the issue of the fact that you're not concerned about her being a delinquent. What you're concerned about is enforcing your segregation laws. Judge Hill didn't hear it. I lost my case. We threatened to have a keep the people off of the buses. They promised that things would be better. But instead of being better, they became worse. But Joanne Robinson, I learned from that experience that Joanne Robinson and E.D. Nixon and Rosa Parks at that time. I, I, I met Mrs. Parks when I was a law student. She lived just about two blocks from the church that I attended. And she was the secretary for the Montgomery branch of the NAACP and was the youth director. So she was very interested in young people. And as a matter of fact, Claudette Carvin had been in one of her youth meetings. Claudette gave the moral courage to Joanne Robinson, to Rosa Parks, to Fred Gray, to Dr. King, and we were determined that when the opportunity presented itself, again, we were going to be sure that what happened to Claudette did not happen to whoever that person was. I had lunch with Rosa Parks almost every day for five days a week from the time I started practicing until the day of her arrest, including the day of her arrest. We talked about what to do and how to act in the event an opportunity presented itself. And on the day of her arrest, she knew that I was going to be out of town that day in the afternoon because after we had lunch, she went back to her job and I went back to work. When I got back in town, I had a call from her and everybody else telling me that Rosa Parks had been arrested. Talked with her on the phone. She had me to come to her house. We went over. She wanted me to represent her. This was on Thursday evening, and she says that the, the, the case is on Monday. And I told her, well, we'll get the case ready. You don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. I left there and went to E.D. Nixon house, Mr. Civil Rights, and I was sure he was ready for us to do whatever needed to be done. Mr. Nixon was a man of action, not a man of, of, of planning. Then I went to Joanne Robinson's house, and I knew Joanne had had the problem. She had been with us with Claudette Carvin. We sat in her living room that night on the 1st of December and the 2nd until the early hours and planned the details for the Montgomery bus boycott. There were several things we concluded. One was that if we're going to ever do anything about the buses, now is the time to do it. And if we're going to do it, we're going to have to have the support of the black preachers because they have more of our people on a weekly basis than anybody else. Then we were going to need to have the support of the black community. And we had two leaders. E.D. Nixon was one I've told you about, another gentleman, Coach Rufus Lewis, but Rufus Lewis was only concerned about voter registration. So what Joanne, we went through, down through the line, assigned responsibilities to each, and she said, well, we got to have a spokesman. And she said, well, I can tell you, my 
pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., hasn't been here long, hasn't been involved in civil rights activities, but he can move people with his words. We said, well, fine, why don't we do that? But what are we going to do with Mr. Nixon and Coach Lewis? If we had made either one of those persons the, 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 the spokesman, we were afraid of losing their supporters. So the idea was, let's have Dr. King as the spokesman give them key supporting roles and see where we go from there. We planted the seed and Dr. King, when the meeting was finally held, was selected the spokesman at a meeting that he did not attend. <laughs> E.D. Nixon was selected as treasurer because he was a Pullman carporter and he knew A. Philip Randolph, the black labor leader in New York who could help to raise money. And Rufus Lewis was selected chairman of the Transportation Committee because we had to have some cars and some transportation. And his wife was co-owner of the largest fume home in town and they had access to cars. <laughs> and the young lawyer just out of law school has a responsibility of taking care of the legal work. That's what happened when the chips were down and then when we had the trial on the filth and when Dr. King spoke to the Hope Street Baptist Church on the night of the filth, we knew that the plans we made had come into fruition. I'm taking time to tell you this because so many people think that Ms. Parks just got tired that day. Uh, so many people think that this whole movement was a spontaneous movement, but it was something that had happened over a long period of time and the community was ready. We just needed a leader. Once we did it and once we put it in place, that was the beginning. My activities in connection with the Montgomery bus boycott was just the beginning of my 55-year career in the legal profession that has expanded and changed the landscape in this nation, the right to vote, transportation, schools, airports, and even in healthcare with respect to the men in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. But what I realized at the very beginning was that I was just out of law school and I remember what Professor Sonfield had told me. He said, now when you go back to Alabama after he tried to convince me to stay up here and I told him I couldn't stay, I couldn't really tell him all the why. But he said, don't be afraid to get some other lawyer who has more experience than you. When the Montgomery Improvement Association told me that I had the responsibility of coordinating the legal activities, I got on the phone. I had heard of Thurgood Marshall, and I called him and talked with him. And on the 20th of December in 1955, I went to New York and met with Mr. Marshall and his assistant, Robert Carter, who later became a uh, district court judge in New York, and established a relationship that has lasted for a lifetime. So then what I tell you today is that conditions in Alabama has changed, conditions in the South have changed. We were primarily concerned then about destroying segregation that was sanctioned by law. Now, fortunately, we have been able to remove those sanctions. And now we have a person of color who is president of these United States and one of color who heads the Justice Department as the Attorney General. But I want you to know that while we have made substantial progress, and I believe that what we did during the Civil Rights Movement in Montgomery and what others did in the Civil Rights Movement has contributed greatly toward 
having made the progress we've made. But I want you to know that the struggle continues for equal justice. And I don't want us to think that with the current president and the current attorney general that all is well. But I want to tell you, and then I'm going to stop. I know I've been talking longer than I should have. But there are several things that I think is very important. And I don't think I need to tell an audience like this about the importance of diversity. This university gave me an opportunity to be associated with other individuals and obtain the legal education where I was able to help persons. There are some of you who are lawyers uh, and who are in large international law firms. And you have clients around the world, as well as in this country, and what you could easily do is simply by advising your clients about the importance of diversity, you would be able to help to change a lot of things. It is important, therefore, that as we go forward and try to solve these problems, that we form coalitions of people of all walks of life, regardless of their age and regardless of whatever their condition or life or ethnic background may be, we have important issues that still face this nation. Now, there are some people who believe just because we have the person we have in the White House and in the Attorney General's office, they think that Dr. King's dream has been fulfilled. But I want you to know that is not true. The Marathon Civil Rights Movement began with the arrest of my friend and my client, Rosa Parks, on December 1st. And as I have indicated to you, it all started on the bus, but it continues. Notwithstanding our progress in recent years, we have seen an increase in racism. We have seen and in, uh, including burning of churches, resurgence of hate groups over the nations. There are even activities, these activities to some degree has increased since President Obama has taken office. The United States Supreme Court, for over a quarter of a century, we could depend upon that court to protect the rights of individuals and minorities. But in recent years, there has been a change and that court has made changes and may be just a few decisions away <coughs> from reversing itself <coughs> on many very important constitutional issues. We have also seen a United States district, seen United States district courts and courts of appeals across the nation who, in my opinion, are not nearly as concerned about protecting the individual rights as the courts were during the Warren Supreme Court days. We have seen an assault on affirmative action and other constitutional safeguards that have protected the rights of individuals and made this country great. We even have seen some people who are personally attacking the President of the United States. Now, what does all of this that I have discussed with you this evening mean to those of us on October 6, 2011 in Cleveland, Ohio? What does it mean to us? It means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law. I want to leave you with a challenge. If what I have said to you means anything, it means, unfortunately, that racism is still alive in this country. If the life and work of Dr. King means anything, it means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law, and particularly for women and minorities. 
It means that there is a real challenge as to whether the gains we have obtained will continue or whether we will lose them. If we lose, it means that Dr. King and all those who have given their lives for the protection of human and civil rights will have died in vain. But even more importantly, if we lose, it's not just us, but the nation loses. The struggle has not ended. Racial discrimination in this country has not ended. We do not have a level playing field. There is no such thing as a race-neutral society in America. The consequences of 350 years of slavery, segregation, and discrimination has not disappeared during the last 50 years or so of the enactment of civil rights legislation. Unfortunately, discrimination against African Americans and other minorities still exists in this country. And the unfortunate part about it is we don't seem to realize that we still have a problem. If you believe that African Americans and other minorities now enjoy all of the rights and privileges as the majority, I invite you to read the National Urban League report on the state of black America in 2009. Message to the president and then the one they did uh, a year or so ago. In the report in 09, the Urban League stated that the equity index can be interpreted as the relative status of blacks and whites in American society measured according to five areas, economics, health, education, social justice, and civil engagement. In each, there is a substantial disparity having a negative effect on African Americans as compared to white Americans. The 209 report also states that African Americans are twice as likely as whites to be unemployed, three times more likely than whites to live in poverty, and more than 16 times as likely to be incarcerated. As well, the 2010 report on equity index found that one of the areas with the greatest degree of inequality was social justice, which measures the number of blacks incarcerated versus the educational attainment. In many categories, blacks either make no, made no progress or lost ground. Less than half of black Americans own homes, as were, uh, were more than three times as likely as whites to be below the poverty line. That report also shows a big difference in 2009 real medium household incomes between whites and blacks. Medium for blacks was 34,200 plus, and for whites was 55,500. All of what I'm saying to you is, and that report in 29, this is not my report, this is the Urban League's report, in 209 says, America now faces the first generation of blacks who will earn less than their parents, the first generation of all children who are less likely to go to college than their parents, the first generation whose life expectancy is less than their parents. Where do we go from here? I think what we need to realize is that while we have made a tremendous amount of progress, we still have a long way to go. And while I don't stand here tonight to tell you that all of that is based on race, I do tell you that a lot of it is the result. These disparities that we have is the result of the effect of racial discrimination that has existed over the years. So I want to leave you by suggesting to you that there are about four things I want us to seriously think about. 
I think, and these are my thoughts, and you may not agree with them, but they are mine. One, that this country still has a problem with respect to race. And many of the decisions that we make, we are making them the same way that we made before. And many of the decisions we are making today, we are getting the same results when we look at the numbers now and look at the numbers then. While we have made some progress, we need to realize that racism is a problem in this country. And until we realize it's a problem, we're not gonna be able to solve it. Secondly, it's not gonna go away by itself. The problem started when slaves were landed in what, 1607? And it continues. So if you're gonna solve the race problem, you're gonna to have to come up with a plan. Now we are fighting a couple of wars now, and we may not like those wars, but they are there. Somebody decided that we were gonna have them, and they planned them. If we're gonna ever solve the race problem, we're gonna to have to come up with a plan. There's a third thing. A plan is absolutely no good unless we execute the plan. And the fifth part of it is, if we're gonna solve the problem, guess who's gonna to have to be a part of solving it? Each, each one of us will have to be able to decide that we want to solve it. So finally, as we look and as we think about, since we are on the campus of an educational institution, the challenge before us tonight is to leave here tonight more committed than when we came, to help some young person equip himself or herself with the tools necessary to, concede, to succeed. Each one choose one, choose a brother or a sister to be a mentor for, and that young person who's trying to make it, those of us who have made it, need to stop long enough to try to help that person along the way. Now you may not agree, and I don't stand here asking you to agree with me. The thoughts that I have shared with you this evening are my views. But I think if we work collectively, we can begin to solve the problems. The dialogue is ongoing, however action is needed. We are losing a part of our future to an insidious, destructive, consuming, misbehaving of youth. It may be your neighbor's child that commits the act, but it will be our world that will absolve the cost. Can we afford to pay the price? The clock is ticking and it's all up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Fred. Um, we have time for a few questions before we have to break for the reception. As I said, um, if you have a question, please come down to one of the mics here, and please uh, keep your questions short so that we can get Mr. Gray's answers. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm so proud to have you back in our town of Cleveland. Uh, my name is Leslie Huff, and I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Um, in 2002, we came to your fair city of Tuskegee um, as a part of 
a momentous occasion. I believe it was the first time that the National Bar Association and the American Bar Association came together to hold, or convene a conference in concert with each other. And you were the main focus and the work that you did with the Tuskegee um, experiment uh, survivors. And um, I just wonder if, I know that's a little, well, maybe it's not outside your purview, but those are, that's another one of the examples of the ways in which you help to eliminate discrimination. Um, have there been any other efforts on your part or through the ABA, NBA connection that continue? Because the, uh, the ABA and the a and, and NBA has been working together for years because the two organizations, even as, as far back, as uh, when I was president of NBA in 83 and 84, we worked well together. And I think you're talking about probably a board meeting of the National Bar Association that we did convene in Montgomery, I mean in Tuskegee, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, there is so much history in Tuskegee. And one of the things I wanted the bar to see was a history museum that we have there, the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center. We decided that there was so much history and a part of, of, of solving this whole problem, we have a whole generation of people, young people who know nothing at all about civil rights. So if we don't teach them and they're not getting it in, in, in the schools that they're attending. So my wife and I decided about 10 or 12 years ago before my first wife passed, that we would create a museum that museum would do several things. One, it would show the contributions made by the ethnic groups in the area, Native Americans, Americans of European descent, and Americans of African descent. So if you see what we've all done, then whatever our problems are, we can still solve them. It also serves as a permanent memorial for the men in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. And there were so many of the cases that have come up, has come out of that part of the state, it also shows the role that Tuskegee has played. So what I've been doing for the last 10 years now is making speeches across the country, accepting invitations to people who are willing to make substantial contributions to that center. And none of the money goes to me, it goes directly to them, but it helps to teach individual about the movement and we invite you to come. I think the point you're making is a very important point and I think it's good for all of these bar associations to work together to help solve these problems. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry, I was wondering if you, um, if I could get your opinion on the Troy Davis case and oh, also the, uh, I was wondering your opinions on the Troy Davis case and to what extent you feel that the unfair application of the death penalty to African Americans represents uh, a major civil rights issue for our time as well as the mass incarceration of uh, young black men for relatively minor drug offenses. So the first part of the question is about Troy Davis and the second part is about things which might be new civil rights issues in our time, things like the death penalty and mass incarceration. Well, of course, uh, I may be biased and prejudiced because I don't think that capital punishment serves a purpose that it's designed to do. So, I mean, I, and I don't think, uh, I think it's pathetic that we're even involved in that at all. Secondly, what I tell people all the time is you don't need me to come to Cleveland and tell you about the problems that you still have here as they relate to the various uh, individuals in the various groups. So I think all you have to do, nobody told me when I got, <clears throat> when I went in Montgomery, nobody told me that we had a problem on the buses. I saw it and I came up with a plan where I would do something about it. And I think if we're gonna solve a lot of our problems, whether they're racial problems or economic problems or any of them, we're gonna have to look at ourselves and see what we can do to help solve the problems and you'll be surprised your idea is as good as somebody else's and you may be able to help solve it. I think over here. Uh, right. During your uh, lecture, you, you mentioned that uh, black folks were, were 16 times more likely to be incarcerated than white folks. Um, do, do you think that, that, that the slave drivers of 
of today um, are, are using mass incarceration uh, to take advantage of, a, of the escape clause of, of the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which, which would otherwise prohibit slavery to, to create a, a new Jim Crow system or, or a new form of slavery, as, as, as law professor M Michelle Alexander of, of The Ohio State would, would, would say. Um, did, and if this is so, um, how, how can you say that, that, that there's any progress I at all? I mean, it, it, it just seems like the, the, the same old slavery. The statistic that I gave you are not my statistics, they're a statistic from the National Urban League, but I, I think that we don't, we can use our good common sense and know that we have certainly made a tremendous amount of progress from the time when persons were segregated based on race was sanctioned by the law. We've gotten the law out of the way. At least we've changed that. While we have a lot of other progress to make, I think we are, we've made substantial progress. This is a historical question and an easy one. How did you find out that the state of Alabama would pay your tuition to a school up north? Oh, that was easy. Uh, there's a case that was decided in 1939, I believe, Gaines versus U.S., which was a part of the whole doctrine of separate but equal. And what that coat held in the field of higher education was that if the state supplies to African Americans substantially equal education that they do to whites, then they will be able to, uh, uh, they would satisfy the Supreme Court's test. Now what all the southern states did, as they do on all of these issues, they sit down and they talk, and they say, well, let's come up with a plan. And what all of the southern states, it wasn't just Alabama, but all of the southern states had a plan where African Americans, if the graduate course or the professional course was offered at the white university, not offered at the black college, then they would pay a portion of the tuition room and board, and that would satisfy the requirement of separate but equal under the Gaines case. Yes, sir. You graduated from Alabama State. You were neither a law student or a lawyer. How did you personally find out about that case? Well, the, the state of Alabama would tell you about it. They would? Yeah. And, and the application in, in Alabama, we had to make the application to the uh, superintendent. And uh, Mr. Dr. Meadows was a superintendent at the time, and after I got to be a lawyer, he used to brag over the fact that he signed the voucher so I could get a legal education. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. Yes. Two questions. Um, the first is, what advice can you give to minority law students who are about to enter a profession that is predominantly Caucasian? And the other question is, what advice can you give to lawyers in general who are representing minorities that face prejudice? I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I understood your question. The first question is, what advice can you give to law students who are minorities that are entering a profession that's predominantly Caucasian? <clears throat> well. My general instruction that I give law students is that uh, the legal profession, in my opinion, is a profession that renders service. If you are interested in trying to help people solve problems, then the legal profession, I think, is a good profession to go into. What would you advise l lawyers who are representing minorities that already face prejudice or discrimination against a jury or whatever it may be? Well, because my experience has been whether you're representing a majority or a minority, you basically do the same thing in terms of trial preparation and that sort of thing, if, if that's what you're talking about. Well, if they're already facing discrimination, if the jury already has some kind of mental state behind, or some kind of 
perception of this criminal, future criminal, what do you do? What, and, and thinking a little bit more about what you're saying about, I think now you have any number of, of organizations, some of them are fairly well funded, who are interested in certain problems that minorities have. If you have a client who has a problem that some of these groups are interested in, then usually you can get some help from them to help with those kinds of cases. Thank you for coming, Mr. Gray. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I have sort of three questions in one. You can answer them in any form that you wish. Uh, the first question is, what are, do you see as the main obstacles to eradicating disparities? And what do you see as possibly the greatest solutions? And what are your views on affirmative action? Well, let me just take the easy one. <laughs> and that's on, on affirmative action. I, I don't care what you call something. That doesn't bother me, whether you call it affirmative action. You need to have a plan that will work to do away with discrimination. Whatever plan there is that works, use it, whether it's affirmative action or whether you want to name it something else. Now, what was the other part of your question? Well, there was two other questions. One is, uh, what are the obstacles, the greatest obstacles to, re to eradicating disparities? And what do you see as the best solution? Well, I usually tell people on questions like that and about the disparity and about solving the race problem. I go back to myself. When I went back home and saw the problems that exist on the buses, I didn't have anybody I could go to who could give me a blueprint and tell me what to do. I saw something and concluded that if this problem is going to be solved, I'm going to have to be a part of the solution and try to come up with a plan, discuss it with somebody else, see if they agree with it, and then try to work it. So I don't think there's any magic to solving any of these problems. And all the problems in this country, the racial problems, the economic problems, all of them are very complex problems. They're not easy to solve. It's gonna take everybody and every phase of government and all of these agencies working together to try to solve it. And I think the big problem is that we as individuals have to begin to conclude, I'm gonna to try to help do something myself and then try to get somebody else and see where we go from there. Yes, ma'am. I believe I'm the last question. And I just wanted to know, you mentioned earlier that when you were charged with being in, in charge of the legal processes for the boycott, you called Thurgood Marshall. What did he tell you to do? What did, what did you guys come up with in that conversation? Oh, well, what happened was, of course, this was on, I called him about the 15th of December. The Montgomery bus boycott now has been going on for more than a week. It's headlines all across the nation, so he knew about it. While he didn't know me personally, he knew somebody down there was doing the legal work, and my name had been connected with it. So uh, he was readily, it was very agreeable for me to come to New York and to discuss uh, the whole matter. And what I did, because I took with me then, this is in December, a draft of a complaint that I wanted to file really when Claudette Carvin had been arrested some six months before, so that I would have something to tell him that I think while we're going through a process of, of, of negotiating, I think ultimately we're gonna to have to file a lawsuit, we're gonna need your help. He was very willing to help and actually assigned Robert Carter to me. And Robert Carter and I worked on cases for many, many years until he went on the bench. Let me simply say that if you are interested in uh, knowing more about the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center, see me after this mission. I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, you have done us the extraordinary honor of carrying our banner in your, uh, in your career, and we really can't thank you enough for that. But you also have inspired all of us to recognize that we can't sit by and wait for somebody else to do things. And that is a lesson that all of us need to keep with us every day. This concludes the, the formal part of the program. You are invited to join us outside for a reception uh, around in the, uh, in the, in the foyer. Uh, and uh, I hope that you can continue the conversation with Mr. Gray. Take care.